let me just make you a co-host. Okay. All right, you should be good to go. Okay, share my screen. And I apologize again, I cannot believe I thought it was, it's this week, I'm tell, yesterday I was late for another meeting because I was thinking like it started in five minutes and it started an hour before that. I don't know why. It's the rain, I'm telling you, I'm all <laughs> off. <laughs> Got me all discombobulated, okay. So I'm talking today about screen time and feel free to interrupt me. Um, and I've done this before. I have a great video for us to watch too. Um, I'll have to pull up my screen for that. Uh, Cause I can't get the YouTube videos to go on my PowerPoints anymore. I don't know why, like they won't pull up, but oh well. Okay, so today I am hoping, maybe if I can move my thing over. Oops, I went ahead. Oops, way ahead. So today we're going to uh, explore screen time with children and adolescents. We're gonna talk about the impacts that it has. Um, we all identify that it has some negative impacts, but we're gonna talk about some of the supportive impacts it has as well. Um, and some media plans that we can go through and um, help suggest and recommend to families. So just to clarify, when we're talking about screen time or media, we're not only talking about the game systems, tablets, the phones, but we're also talking about TVs, computers, whiteboards, um, movies. And so just remembering that those are screens as well. And a lot of the times, you know, when I talk with parents about managing screen time, they take out TVs and movies, and so then kids are still getting that extra screen time. I also have a lot of parents now who are asking questions about, um, you know, the impact of screen time that now that they're doing virtual school along with utilizing screens. And so um, there's not a whole lot recently on that, but that will be interesting uh, coming out. So naturally we think about some of the negative impacts and the biggest two influencers, influencers on negative impacts are um, of course how much time is spent on screen time and what type of content they're watching or listening to or playing. And so it's really that time and that content that have the biggest influences on, on kids and adolescents. Um, but we also know that it can interfere with sleep in both areas. Uh, it can create distractibility. So not only can um, the game systems be a distraction themselves or the screens be a distraction themselves, but it can, be, it can create distractibility. So a lot of the times kids will learn that they have to pay attention to other things while they're either watching a screen, watching a movie, um, playing a game. And so then it creates some of that distractibility, increases that stimulation and it makes it more difficult for them to sit still at times when there's that lower stimulation. And so um, it can create that distractibility. It also can create a background noise that kids can become accustomed to. A lot of kids sometimes need the background noise now to fall asleep or go to sleep or stay asleep, right? How many of us need like the TV on when you fall asleep, right? So you kind of need that background noise. Um, and sometimes that, that can create a, a negative impact on kids. It can create a negative impact on their development. Um, many of the times you'll see kids that have the, the TV just playing in the background, right? Um, and they'll be playing. And so parents will say it doesn't interfere with their play because they're, they're playing. And kids need different stages of play throughout their lives. And at one point they need, you know, that pretend play and it, and it, it definitely serves a purpose. And if we have some of that background noise being a distraction, it'll disrupt that. Um, and it can disrupt development along with that. Because you'll see kids, like if they have a, a cartoon or something on, they'll be playing and doing whatever, and then they'll hear something start and they'll turn to the TV, right? And they'll just be deadlocked onto the TV. And so, and then they'll go back to playing. And then they'll go, they'll, and so parents will say, they don't watch it the whole time. Well, then really just turn it off, right? Just turn it off. We don't need the background noise. Um, and many of the times kids are left unattended. And so we'll talk about, we'll talk about the importance of planning for that, but a lot of the times um, parents depend on screens to, to kind of babysit kids, right? To keep them busy and keep them occupied. And so many of the times kids are left unattended and this can lead to, um, to content that they should not be getting into. Uh, things can pop up on screens, kids will hit buttons and sometimes it opens windows for things that they really shouldn't be seeing. 
a lot of parents will ask about the effects of media on language. And so what the research really shows is that um, it doesn't really have a huge effect on language, except that um, if the increase of screen time is reducing the parent-child interactions, so the interactions with the parents, then yes, it will have an impact on their language development. However, um, if, if the parents remain involved, it might not. Um, and educational content, again, making sure that some of the content in the screen time can actually really promote some, some language development, uh, as long as the parents are involved in making sure that that's happening. So um, some screen time, sometimes there's, um, there's some shows that will talk about like, um, you know, new words. So they'll say cat and you'll see that you'll see them use their mouths, right? In the, in the movement and the formation can be really helpful. Um, you can see that they'll nurture language development, like they'll start to say like the CHs, right? Or the STs, gusta. And you'll see them really pronounce these pieces in, in some of the screens and shows, and that can be helpful. Um, also parents promoting the language development. So helping kids with positive reinforcement of language development. We talk about reflecting appropriate verbalizations and not necessarily correcting a kid. That helps with language development. And so that's more of that one-on-one -on -one time. Um, having language rich peers. So those, those friends that talk a whole lot are actually really good for kids who are developing their language or for kids who are struggling with language development. Um, having kids kind of talk around them or talkative parents. There was a study I read one time where um, parents who talked a lot on the phone, now some of the content that was repeated was not appropriate, but it helped increase language development, right? Because the parents were constantly talking. Um, but also to help with language development, narrating daily activities. So some shows will do that. They'll talk about walking down the street and going to the cupboard. And so parents can do that as well. If they're narrating their everyday activity, they can increase language development. And parents don't usually think of that, like that's the last thing you're doing. Like you think about it in your head, but you don't talk, you don't think about talking about it. Like I'm gonna walk over here and I'm gonna change your diaper and we're gonna grab the powder, right? Like nobody thinks about that, but it really helps with language development and labeling things. So the impacts of media on infants and toddlers, um, we know that infants and toddlers learn from their environment. And so if they have an increased screen time, then they're not getting to explore their environment. And they require some of that physical stimulation, that rough and tumble play is important. Um, and so it's really important for them to have that. And the screen time will reduce that and limit it. And so uh, we know that that can be a barrier. They also need to experience real life challenges versus screen time. Kids get really frustrated sometimes on screens when they can't get games to go their way or things to happen their way. And that, that stress can be good, right? But it's kind of hard for parents to help them problem solve. I mean, how many parents can honestly say that they can help their kids overcome a game, right? Like I could never be able to do that. If, if one of my kids said like, I can't overcome this challenge, you need to do it. Like no way would I be able to complete that, right? So then they're just gonna get mad at me. So, but, but I could totally help them if they were putting together Legos or something. I can't say it would be perfect, but I could totally help them do that, right? And so a lot of the times parents have a, a difficult time helping kids overcome some of those challenges. And kids need to have some of that stress in other areas too. We don't want them to always be, um, and, and games are less predictable and, and you can't control those situations many of the times. And so a lot of the times um, that's a very difficult stress to kind of experience. And what will happen is then when they're faced with real life challenges, they're kind of triggered back to that stress that they're used to managing and they act the same way instead of regulating. And so it can cause problems. We know it can cause sleep disturbances as well, poor eating habits. A lot of kids will eat in front of the screen. And when they're eating in front of the screen, we all know that that's not a really good healthy choice because then they consume way more. They're not paying attention to how much they're eating or what they're eating. And sometimes they're eating too much or they're not eating enough. Um, I, had, I had one kid that came to me. She, I mean, she was an adolescent, she was 15, but she would totally forget to eat. Like she would go on these binges, these game binges and like not eat for eight hours straight and like not even realize it. And I was like, oh, I don't know how you do that. I mean, I can't relate to that. Um, attention and focus. 
So again, the screens will take away um, from attention and focus and the ability to be attentive and focus. Um, the, high, the high exposure to stimulation can um, cause them to become inattentive in low stimulating situations. And so if you compare that, like, you know, the high stimulation of a screen, things blinking, moving fast, like fast noises, different colors. I mean, that is way more stimulating than sitting at school and listening to your teacher and writing something down, right? And so a lot of the times that can definitely create some inattentiveness. For adolescents, same thing, some sleep disturbances, um, low activity, uh, behavior concerns. We can see a lot of behavior concerns come out. Also, it can limit social engagement. And so um, a lot of adolescents will then depend on, and, and I'm struggling with my adolescents with this now too, especially with COVID, you know, things being so remote um, that they're, they're having a difficult time with social engagement. So a lot of the times when adolescents are exposed to a lot of media or screen time, then when it comes to one-on-one -on -one interaction with individuals, they, they become very uncomfortable. It's, it's an awkward situation for them, right? And adolescents can be an awkward situation to begin with. And so um, this just can add to that. And then metabolic syndromes, we're seeing a lot of high blood pressure, high sugars, um, weight gain uh, with adolescents who are utilizing too much screen time, um, not getting enough activity. There's actually, so these are, um, I'll go through the three handouts. The CDC has some great handouts recommending screen time versus lean time. So they talk about the hours of screen time that that typical age range has, um, how much of it is watching TV, and then alternatives that they can do, right? So for eight to 10 year olds, uh, the average is six hours a day. That's a lot of screen time. Um, and different things that they can do outside of that, right? And brainstorming and what the recommended time frame is, how parents can help. And then when you move to 11, 14, it even increases to nine hours a day. Um, and it's interesting because it goes up and then you'll see it like go down. But so it increases and then things that they can do. And then um, with teenagers, it goes down a little bit. So maybe they're, they're like getting out there a little bit more and, and socializing. Um, but things that they can do. And the recommended, I mean, the recommended screen time for anyone over two is two hours. And so that's it. And when I tell parents that, they're like, no way, like I can't do that. My kid is gonna flip out. And so we talk about ways to titrate that down to like slowly bring the kid down because we do know that screens have an addictive component. I mean, there's a lot of literature out there um, that talks about um, it having the same impacts of cocaine on the brain, right? On the neurotransmitters. And so you, you see these spikes and decreases and spikes and decreases. And I've talked about this before in the, the book that talks about that is, and I can't remember who writes it, but it's called Resetting Your Child's Brain. And it talks about ways that you can work with families on kind of resetting that, right? And so ways to like slowly move them away from screen time down to the two hours, because if they're going from nine hours a day to two hours, that's a lot and you're gonna get tons of behaviors initially. So we talk about ways to slowly do that and wean them kind of off of the screen. But they're also recommending that kids under two should not have screen time. And um, a lot of parents love a lot of the educational pieces and, um, I made the mistake when I typically don't do this, but I don't know what I was thinking that day, but um, on social media, on, on a social media site, somebody had said, you know, what's the best tablet for my one-year-old? And I put no tablet. I said, that's the best thing to do. Um, and like, I, I've just, I mean, it was just a response. I don't, and I don't typically do that. And then I got like a million like things like, oh, it doesn't, I, I get tablets. There's nothing wrong with it. And I'm like, oh, like totally open to can of worms, right? Um, Cause a lot of people feel very differently, but they're recommending that under two, you should not. I had one, one, um, one of my friends reach out to me and she's like, but I do the baby Einstein with my baby and sit down and have the screen time is, you know, they think that's okay. And I'm like, not really. Like, I don't, I don't think that's okay. Like the best time is you and your baby. Like, so, you know, and when you need a break, play music, play a lullaby, play their, their mobiles, right? Something physical they can see and, and think about. And, you know, I think of, um, I even think of 
when I was little and going on trips and how kids don't even don't even do that anymore, right? Because they're on screens during long trips. And I just think of the things that I used to think of, like looking out the windows and seeing things and how we're just taking that away from them and, and not allowing them to use their imagination that way and throughout their lives. And so we're missing out on some of those things. A lot of the times we talk about music versus screen time. So parents will say like, is music just as like harmful? And it's not. So the literature supports that it is not. It doesn't really interfere with learning. Um, it doesn't have the same impact as screen time. And music is actually can be beneficial for um, relaxing and calming individuals. So it helps with regulation. Um, and there's, you know, uh, there's even there's tons of studies on different types of music and how it impacts individuals and um, types of personality versus music and what music is calming for specific personalities. I mean, it's it there's tons out there, but it actually can be really beneficial a lot and especially for kids, you know, a lot of the kids that I have with ADHD. I've, I've had three three kids now that I've wrote um, letters for asking that they can have one um, ear pod in while they they're at school and while they do their homework and while they and it actually for kids who have some extreme ADHD their their academics have increased when they were able to do that because they had that little bit of distraction right it's actually really helpful for them sometimes um, but it depends on on the situation there is some discussion that it reduces language input because in at, at certain ages. So um, in younger uh, preschool toddlers, a lot of the times what's happening is um, the language input um, music produces the same stimuli um, uh, for the to the working memory that um, works with linguistics as well. And so sometimes it can just interfere with that. Um, but I mean, that's that's if it's it's repetitive. So looking at media and how it can be supportive, uh, you know, looking at different shows and what they what they provide and how they provide and being very picky about it. And so PBS has always been one of the best, right? Like PBS has all of the books, all of the research that I've ever read has has never had anything negative to say about PBS. And so PBS has actually been promoted through and I'm not talking about positive behavior supports because we have so many of those, right? <laughs> no, we're talking about um, the public broadcasting services. And so, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of literature supports public broadcasting services. So they must do a lot of, of research around what's good for kids and, and um, what promotes development. But you'll see some shows that kind of put some of these supportive pieces out, but also some of our avoid skill, like our avoid media pieces. So some of the supportive pieces that you're looking for, like smart boards are great. They're really helpful to engage kids and to utilize and to keep that engagement back and forth. And that's what you want to do. Um, so that's a supportive piece, like anything that can help kids read aloud, start their language development, um, identify shapes, colors, sorting, right? We have all kind of of shows that do that. But we want to make sure we're staying away from the loud, the fast moving, different colors, multiple bright colors, um, explicit language, naturally we want to stay away from. But, um, you know, one time in our clinic, I had the fellows uh, for, for the time frame of our clinic, they had to go and find a preschool kids show and they had to watch it and they had to kind of write down how it, how it impacts um, social emotional development, right? And so um, we went through some of the pros and cons about it. And mine was bubble guppies. And I picked, I get so addicted to that like theme song, the bubble, 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 guppy, guppy. So it's like, I'm going to watch bubble guppies because I never really sat down and watched it. So I sat down and watched it in bubble guppy. I mean, and I've always heard good things about it, right? Like they provide great, and, and they did, they provide real life experiences. So my show, they, they introduced helper people. They introduced like police officers, firefighters, like great real life experiences that could be helpful for kids. They also did great with shapes and sorting, but they were loud and fast moving and like distract, like there, it was from one topic to the other. And I was like, whoa, what is going on? It was so fast, like from one to the other. And then at one point they were like playing a game in the middle of it. And I was like, what, 
what just happened? Like, how did we get here? Like, where, where did this come from? And so it's pretty, it's pretty interesting to see some of these shows and, and to really, I mean, I'm, I, it makes me wonder how many parents really sit down and watch some of these shows. Like, cause I never, I mean, I watched bits and pieces of it. And so I saw some of the positive pieces, but then when I sat down and watched it all the way through, I was like, Whoa, like this is too much. Like, no wonder why kids are really hyper after this and, and distractible. And so you can see the high stimulation there. And really, I mean, the screens are not going anywhere, but we definitely want to create some safe cyber citizens here. So we want to make sure that parents are staying involved. And that's the biggest piece you'll see through some of the media plans that parents are staying involved um, and exploring with our kids, keeping that conversation open, uh, identifying what kids know about media and social media and screens. I mean, kids know a whole lot about screens and parents will tell you all the time, like my, the five-year-old can get on the tablet better than me. The five-year-old can navigate this better than me, right? Because they do. And so we want to embrace some of that and make sure that we're, we're not just completely shutting it off because we know what will happen with kids if we completely shut things off, right? They become rebellious and they want that more and more and more. And so we want to do it in a safe way. Um, talking about what words to use when they're interacting, who they can talk to, when they can talk to them, what they're putting out there is permanent, right? We hear about, especially in adolescence, some explicit things being put out in there and not even realizing it's permanent. Um, you know, kids are, kids are being damaged in that way. Sometimes they're sending explicit pictures and they think they're sending it to one person and it ends up being the entire school then. And, and you're, dam you're dealing with damage control then. And so by talking about it ahead of time, not saying that you're gonna eliminate that, but at least preventing it and making people aware like, hey, like this is permanent. Like once it's out there, it's, you can't get it back. Like, and who knows who gets it after that? And so, um, really making them aware and privacy and how important privacy is, right, for even kids. I, I'm sure you all saw that um, there was like two years ago, there was an app called Talking Tom and um, predators actually got a hold of that and able to come through and it was a cat that talks and they were asking kids for personal information, like where they live, their house numbers, and they were giving them because they didn't know, right? Like, and when you're learning that at five or six years old and you're learning that you're reciting it, you're just waiting for someone to ask you. So, but teaching them about what that privacy is and what that should look like. So that brings us to social media plans. There are a lot of social media plans and I'll talk to you guys about some of them. And I have some handouts that I will, I will, give Mithra as well to kind of give to everybody and um, but the the different social media plans will go over but really you're looking at social media plans that can um, develop expectations together now naturally with a five-year-old you're not gonna be able to develop a whole lot of expectations together you're gonna have to sit those expectations down um, but with adolescents, absolutely. Um, Preteens, absolutely. Nine, 10 year olds, absolutely. Sitting down and talking about expectations together. They might have some pretty out there expectations that you need to reel back in, but that's okay because that's job as a parent. Uh, providing clear guidelines, like when they get screen time, how much screen time they get and sticking to that consistently giving age appropriate options and staying engaged. Many of the times parents will set those limits and then they'll be like, okay. But the reality is, is you wanna stay engaged. You wanna stay involved in watching things. And um, when they're on their different games, sitting down with them, right? That's the most boring thing in the world. I hate sitting, that's awful. I say, I, I, I don't even like saying hate to anything, but I hate sitting down and watching my daughter play like a game on her her phone like it is the most boring thing and and the game she plays makes absolutely no sense to me i mean she builds these houses and then she just like walks around different neighborhoods and sees different people like i mean it's she, and she gets so excited about it and wants to tell me about it and i try to stay engaged but i mean i i do get a little bored but um i stay engaged because there's other people at those games right i want to know what she's doing i want to know what's in and, and, and i want her to know that i'm always going to stay engaged and so um i do it reluctantly but um i definitely do it so expect manipulation right so kids are going to manipulate. They're going to try to get away with things. And so that's why parents have to stay engaged, have to keep the, the passwords and have to explore. 
I talk to parents about reducing um, incentivizing with any type of screen time. So a lot of the times we do have to use screen time to incentivize because sometimes that's the only incentive, especially if that's all they do. So while we get into working with some other things, we'll limitly will limit the, the screen time incentive and we'll move away from that being an incentive. But sometimes we have to start out there, but try to reduce incentivizing screen time. And I talk with parents about reducing giving screen time um, for negative behaviors, right? A lot of the times if they're in public places and kids start to act out, they'll hand the screen so that they'll reduce some of that behavior when in reality, they're just reinforcing that negative attention seeking. And so um if they want to reduce that behavior kind of stay away from giving the screens then and so we talk about that so these are some of the media plans we're going to go over the screen sense and the e-aims but um these these are four of the main media plans that are recommended for um kids and the e-aims so the e-aims is um you want to make sure that the child is engaged that there's a goal right what is the purpose of them using the screen? Is it to play a game? Like as a parent, every time know the goal. And that's a, that takes a lot of work, right? Like, what are you getting on? What do you want the screen for? Well, I want to go on a game and I want to, I want to take pictures and I want to color this thing. Okay. So there's a goal, you know that, right? So be engaged with it. Is the child actively involved? Are they thinking about things? Are they playing? Are they, actively involved or are they just sitting there with that Care Bear stare in front of the screen, right? If they got the Care Bear stare going on, then maybe shut the screen time off. Um, they're not actively involved. They're not using their brain. They're not thinking. And so then it, it really takes away from it being even meaningful. So is it meaningful? Um, does the content reflect everyday life? Uh, is it realistic? So if it's not realistic, maybe limiting that. Um, and does it encourage social interaction? You'll notice with a, a lot of younger kids, um, you know, some of the, I can't remember what the one show was that one of the, the students had watched that they brought and it really engaged other, like others to participate, right? They sat there and they stopped and they waited for them to participate and then they set it together. And then, so they really encourage that um, participation with them too. So that was a good thing. In the screen sense, they talk about um, limiting screen time, sometimes using uh, security with that, avoiding background noise. So again, um, the background noise is just kind of reducing that. Um, removing screens from the bedroom. So screen sense really talks a lot about how keeping screens in the bedroom kind of promotes that stimulation there and keeping the bedroom as like a low stimulated area. Um, choosing child content. Um, interactive experience, again, experiences that will will interact. Connecting it to daily activities. So Screen Sense has some really great tools and tips on um, how to how to bring that into the everyday. So like it, it gave an example of one parent staying engaged with their kid who was like seven or maybe six and they were like counting oranges and apples and on the game and then later they went to the grocery store and you know mom's like look, here's the oranges and apples like from your game, right? So she's bringing the, the game into real life and kind of helping them see what's realistic and what's not. This can be helpful for kids who kind of have a difficult time identifying that, right? Like thinking, again, you're looking at the content, but sometimes kids are like fighting ninjas or doing this and they think that those are real and it's not real. It's not going to be in real life. So bringing them into the real life with it connecting those daily activities. It talks a lot about, so if you have parents that are doing video chats, and this can be helpful right now with COVID too, about um, being creative during your video chat. So some great creative tips on helping parents. So if you have parents that are doing visitations or grandparents doing visitations, they give great ideas of reading the same stories. So having the same storybooks, reading the same stories, playing puppets through the screen, like really different ways to keep kids engaged into video chats because it's really hard, especially for younger kids to do video chats. I mean, if you've noticed kids don't really chat when it's, you know, on video for a long period of time, they don't have a whole lot to talk about unless they're showing you something or unless they're super excited about something. Taking a minute, so we're gonna, I'm gonna show you guys a video too. So parent screen use, um, just helping parents to be aware too that their background noise, I had a parent telling me, um, you know, they had a kid come in and, and 
some really extreme behaviors. I mean, this kid was, and then um, what, what brought them in, the kid was four years old and what brought them in was the kid was talking about like killing people, right? And they're like, I have no clue where he would have got this. He doesn't, he doesn't watch any of that. He doesn't see any of that, but dad kind of likes horror films and dad would watch some horror films sometimes while the kid was playing. And he's like, but you know, he's in the other room. He's not, re he never watches it. If he watches it, I pause it. And if he turns around to see it, it pa it's still background noise, right? He's still hearing it. There's still some input there. And so a lot of times kids will pick up, see when we don't think they're listening, they're always listening. Um, so screen use for parents is a huge distraction and this is becoming a really big problem. We have a lot of parents who are digitally distracted anymore and it's, it's creating problems within family dynamics and so really helping parents be aware of how much screen time they're using and what's distracting them from that. I've had so many parents, one of the you know, one of the things that we do with behavior modification, of course, is um, we start to look at routines. And one of the routines that a lot of parents put in place once they start to identify it as a distraction is their phones. So a lot of parents will say, you know, we're, we put the phones in as soon as we come home. And so they created that. And, and it's amazing how much more positive interaction families will get when they start to limit those distractions. And it's, it's pretty amazing, but, but it's, it's for parents as well. So they're increasing interactive time. Um, again, what are you watching during that screen time? And just talking to parents about being good role models, right? And how important that is. So I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna share my video, maybe, if I can find it. Well. Hang on one second. Okay. I frantically moved to my to my um, Zoom when I realized how late I was, so I had to. Okay, guys, I think I got it now. Okay. Oh well, almost. So this, I will show you guys this, I, I'm going to send this out, but this is kind of a decision tree with the E-AIMS. So like um, it asks you what to ask parents and if you say yes, where to go, and if you say no, where to go and what to do. And so just some ideas on, on one of the media plans, but I will send that out to you. Okay. A new special is called Screen Time. Can you all hear that? About something many Can you all see it? About how much of okay. our time do we spend on our screens? And Diane, reunited, and it feels so good. <laughs> so, <laughs> You've seen those stats. Yes. 49 days on average. Nine days of our life each year <laughs> on mobile phone, on average. So we're looking at a month and a half of our life spent that way. And we are hearing over and over again stuff started on Sunday about the struggle in American families, parents, the kids, the relationships, everybody wondering what's happening with the science and our brains, what have we come with it from the different, and most of all, I think everybody just wants the balance. Can we have the ease of our technology and have the fullness of our lives as well? We're gonna show you something based on another stat, which is on average, on average, we pick up the phone 80 times a day on average on average and so some researchers wanted to know what that would mean in the lives of kids is they okay with that or is this something that they're paying attention to and maybe all we don't notice when we're just home alone without the cameras a mom comes into a laboratory she's asked to scroll and type and focus on her screen just for two minutes the videotape showing something maybe adults don't see when we're home alone. This is not about parent doping because parents feel so poor and, and sometimes we have to get things done. This is two and a half year old Jensen. I think he's about to suss out that she's on the device. It takes just 15 seconds for Jensen to start his campaign to get mom Melissa to look up from that screen. Answer me, my daughter. Answer me, my daughter. And he just walks in. Yeah. This mom is helping researchers replicate a study for us. She's doing something very difficult for her. Ask to keep looking down. And remember, just for two minutes, he repeats the plea seven times. Yeah, no, thank you, mommy. Mommy! 
And here is another fact about phone-ups and phones. On average, we unlock our phones 80 times a day. Cell phones, I think, are qualitatively different than other forms of distraction because they're with us all the time. They're ubiquitous. They have been engineered to grab our attention. In the old day, phones were chained to the wall, but today a child sees our heads go down, our eyes rivet on something or someone else. What you have is that little sneak down. We've all noticed through the dinner conversation, and basically it means I'm not talking to you anymore. I'm pretending to talk to you. And no one can be sure how long before your eyes look up again. This is little Hunter, who seemed to have learned when she has to compete with the phone, she might as well just give up. She's sitting down and she's waiting. She knows her mother is not available right now. When it was over, Jensen's mom said it was a revelation. I was actually really surprised at his reaction. So did this mom. I think you don't realize when you're at home in your own environment. I think I'll pay attention more now to not pick my phone up. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that kids under 18 months should avoid screens entirely, with the occasional exception of a few minutes of FaceTime with family. <laughs> I really don't want to be still tripping parents. Um, with the study or the implication. But I do want this study to be a wake-up call, that face-to-face -face time we have with our children is not just the economy, it is the cake. It is the place that children learn most about the world and about themselves. Precious <laughs> baby, yes. And again, every part oh. of our lives, it it's starts still going by beginning just looking at possibilities, looking at what we are, and that's what we're setting out to do and why we... All right. So what did you guys think of that? That was really hard to watch. I'm feeling very guilty as a parent. I'm sure I've done that a million times. And it's a little bit heartbreaking. I, it reminds me, I watching some of those attachment videos that I used to watch, and it really has that disconnected attachment feel that feels so icky. It was, it was hard to watch. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. Gonna, I was going to say, was this before COVID too? It was, yeah. And so then I, so what my, my kids guilt trip to me is the two and a half year old will say, um, mommy, I'm doing work stuff. And when I'm done, then I will talk to you. And I'm like, oh, where did you learn that? You learned that from me. Yep. And you think of all these parents having to do this work from home kind of shuffle that's happened in the past year. And even if it's not just the phone, it's, it's work and it's everywhere. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the stress that kids feel from that and, and, you know, how guilty parents feel, like, I totally feel guilty. And so even when working with parents and talking about screen time, like, they already feel guilty about it. And so in removing it sometimes can create even more stress. And so it's almost like it's, it's almost like defeating once you even talk about it. And so it's really about motivating them towards what they want to do and goals and remaining engaged talking about it in a way that it could be a positive it, you know having these media plans can be a positive piece right just set up a media plan and moving towards that and so yeah absolutely your, your mind automatically goes to some of that guilt and and the, it makes me think of the one like I, i've talked about and even for myself as a professional like i talked about in, in one of our reflective supervisions about how the screen time now allows me to be so distracted and how I hate that. Like, I don't feel like I am present in some meetings. Like if we were in person, I said I would be having so many more ideas, but I'm doing so many different things sometimes when I'm on the screen, like, how do I stop that? And, and, it, and that woman saying like, once you see those eyes look down or go somewhere else, then you know, like, I'm not really listening to you. And you're like, oh, like I do that, like awful. And so, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, I agree. I mean, my husband and I now, like, I, we will not pull our phones out. It's like a rule. If we're going out to dinner or when we're eating dinner, unless we're sharing something with each other, 
because I hate when I go out to dinner and nobody's conversating. They're just looking down, growing like a hunchback on their back and not paying attention to the person they're at dinner with. It's just to me so rude. Like, what is the point? I might as well just go sit at the bar by myself and have a drink and talk to the bartender, you know, like at that point. But it just, you know, it's upsetting. And um, I do think it's an addiction. I mean, I'm guilty sometimes of it, but I really try hard to be present even during like these things. Like I try to ignore everything else going on. And just like you said, we need to be present in the moment or looking out the car window. I will say I've played video games since I've been like four years old. Um, I love them and I still play them to this day. And, but my parents are really good about blending, um, making sure I had activities, physical activity. Mm-hmm. They blended, you know, making sure I was, you know, I was danced, so I was a dancer. And, you know, making sure that I was getting up and moving around and not just playing video games. So I think it's a delicate balance, but it does have positives. It was an escape for me. It built on my imagination because I play role playing games and it, it really helped me. So it was like therapeutic and really good for me and it still is. Yeah. Yeah. So it can still be a, a healthy escape now, but you've learned to kind of balance that out. And I think that, like you said, like your parents were really good at, at implementing. So they had a media plan. They had a media plan before they even knew it. Yay. <laughs> See? Um, but yeah, I think, I think it can be really helpful when I, and, you know, not to be critical of others who, you know, don't really, and, in in and like those videos, sometimes parents don't even realize, and, and sometimes kids don't even realize. We went out to eat one time. I took one of my son's friends out to eat with us. He was the same way, like in his phone the whole time. And so after, and we don't have phones at our dinner table. And afterwards I said to my son, I was like, don't you ever go out to eat with a family and stay on the phone the whole time. And I was like reaming him. And he said, why am I getting in trouble for his behavior, mom? He said, I don't even do that. And I was like, I'm just saying, like, did you see how rude that was? And, but we don't know how, you know, how, how his family is. And so, you know, just not being critical, but it, it can't come off very rude if you're not, if you're not used to that. No, I'm really glad because I've requested trainings for screen time so I am thrilled that you did this today um I'm not for sure I mean this is kind of like my flip side of it too but there is a Netflix documentary called The Social Dilemma um I've watched it it's it's really shocking on how it's geared to promote addiction um Mm -hmm. just the way the programs are written just the way all that so when you watch that it's kind of eye-opening but there was another study talking about um, teenagers and they did um, like between four class periods of the notifications that they were getting um, within like maybe a three hour four hour period it was astronomical like I don't even remember the number but they were just talking about how distracting it is like regardless of the situation they're getting notifications from group chats uh, gaming uh, subscriptions Minecraft I mean whatever their apps and it's just, it was like thousands and thousands of notifications. And I think that plays another role in it too. Just. Yeah, it, absolutely. It's, it's kind of like good and bad, kind of damn if you good, damn if you, know, if you don't like what she was saying, Elizabeth, like um, you have to find that balance. And I think for adolescents, it's really hard to strive for that. Yeah, I think you bring up some really great points, Mariah. And there's two pieces in there I want to address is the, The notification piece, it's in a lot of the research talks about how addicting the notifications are for the teenage population. And so the notification, that ding and those those like immediate notifications is like an instant gratification. And so it it definitely is addicting piece. Um, They talk about ways to kind of reduce that. So turning off notifications naturally could be one. Um, There's also in in that resetting your child's brain, that book, they talk about um, changing the changing your your phone from color to black and white so there's something with the brain and having it black and white it's not as appealing and so they won't look towards the notifications as often but even you're right like even for younger kids like they're market like some of these in in these tv shows know what they're doing right they're marketing to get these kids to want to watch them and so like i was saying like with bubble guppies right like for one the the tune is totally addicting for me maybe but um but it's, it's they, they know certain ages with primary colors, right? And really you should have softer colors for, for screen time, but they know that, that kids are stimulated by primary colors. So they use a lot of the bright primary colors. They, they market very well. They research and they market it very well. So you're absolutely right. 
And it's also shocking. I mean, you have, I've seen some interviews where some of the top creators like you know, Steve Jobs and Mark and, you know, Facebook creator, I mean, they'd even talk about like, oh yeah, I don't allow my kids to do that. I don't allow my kids on the social media. And I'm like, what? You helped create it and you're giving it to billions and billions of people. But yet you're like, oh no, I don't let my family do that. And I'm like, huh, how do you sleep at night? If you know <laughs> where, you know, you're limiting for your own family, but yet you're allowing other families in the world to subject it to it. So no, I find this completely to be interesting topic. Like I could just go on forever about it. Like, I think it's, it's true for any, at any age, adults, Absolutely. you know, adolescents, kids, it's, it's becoming now a norm of our society. And I just am curious about the effects, even with like the eyes, like I've always questioned, I mean, my stepdaughter will have her TV playing with her laptop up playing a video game with her cell phone on with a group chat going on. I'm like, you have three different screens going on. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's a lot. And I'm wondering, does it like even have effects on weakening your eyesight? It's just constantly being on a screen all the time. So, all right, I'll stop. <laughs> no, I think you have some really good points. I mean, there's, there's some, I mean, they created glasses now to help reduce um, the impact on, on your eyesight because of screen time. And, and I have to say that like I've needed, I've needed a change in prescription since COVID because I'm constantly on the screen. Like, and it got to the point by the end of the day, I seriously couldn't read anything. <laughs> it's like, I can't even read. So it, it definitely impacts. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, thank you. I will share everything um, so that you guys can have access to it all. Can I apologize for being late? It's so rude. Like, it's so rude of me. I was like, oh no, it's the first Wednesday. It's like eating at the table with your phone. Come on, man. <laughs> Seriously, what? Yeah, it is, it is. I'm it just is. kidding. It's all right. It's completely fine. <laughs> but no, it was a really great discussion. I think we all could talk about it. And, and so, I think it's interesting because we all probably have our own idea of what it is and you know it's just it's it's a very complex thing and it's just going to keep being discussed so thank you so much amanda for a wonderful presentation i'll make sure i get all the resources out to you guys when i send the recap over um the only announcement i have is that the next time we have a session will be may 19th we'll have a guest speaker that day from dentistry stephen whitaker and he'll be discussing oral manifestations and management of dental patients with psychiatric disorders. So that might be really very interesting to attend. I mean, I don't know about you, I'm stressed every time I go to dentist. So maybe you'll have some tips about how that is. Um, but happy Cinco de Mayo, I have my taco blanket on and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks guys.